Hey, yes. welcome back to Wild Speculations. I'm Daniel. I'm Scott. This week we talk about Campaign 2, Episode 40, 84, Titles and Tattoos. Yes. Good episode. Uh, first episode in a long time that I actually watched all of it Thursday night. Um, which was weird because I was I've been fairly tired. Um, but anyway, uh, maybe it was off the bat the adrenaline spike I got from. Liam and Sam getting yeah cheated stolen from, I don't know however you want to define it Liam clearly stated that he left Halas's body in the yes prison Willie went and put it in the stairwell yep uh, Sam had the gem. And for whatever reason, Taliesin, I don't know why, but Taliesin said, I have it, I think. Which prompted Sam to go, no, I have it. And the, the grin on his face told me that I, we were basically right, that he was planning on keeping the gem yep. long term and was going to have some con going on. So... I was a little upset at that. Yusa burns the body? Yeah, I don't know. I was like, what spell is that? And I thought, well, maybe it wasn't burning. Maybe it was blight. Because blight, the corpse would blacken. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I was trying to pin down what he was casting. On Thursday night, and on my rewatch, it occurred to me that maybe Halas's body was a major image. Yeah, that could be. And he was just showing the Mighty Nine, him burning them, so that they would give him the gem. That would be the easy way to retcon what happened. Yeah. Um, I, I think it was a matter of not remembering. That's the hope. Um, so I think this, this episode is a good example. And I think we'll talk more about it as we go, I think. But it was a great example of we the DM has plans, and he wants to get through them. And I think in Matt's notes, he expected them to bring Halas back with them. Or in his mind, he had manufactured that memory. Yeah. And Halas Halas's body was with them as well as the gem, because he knew they had the gem. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, burning the body, how did, that doesn't really prevent anything. No. Um, because if it is a fifth edition variant of Trap the Soul, you dispel the gem, he can jump into anybody and fight for it. Yeah. If it's imprisonment, which Trap the, which we talked about last week, and Trap the Soul is wrapped into that per the design team, you know, yeah. and leads. Then you dispel the gem and he's coming back in his body anyway. Yeah, because his body. Or he can the jump. Gym. Or he can jump to somebody. Yeah. So it doesn't really prevent anything. No. So even if the body was there, the burning of the body was just a show to placate the simpletons, the lower level simpletons, into getting his way. Yeah. Um. And also doesn't preclude another clone being active in the ball. That's true, too. Um, and I'm, I've thought about going and, and, you know, going through the clone spell with the fine-tooth comb and discussing that tonight. 
but I don't think ultimately it matters one way or the right. other. Well, if you want to go with what's been said in game, then there's at least one clone at the bottom of the stairs to the present. <laughs> Fair, yeah. Um, but after the final meeting with Yusa and pressing for more Tadore council names. Yes. Um, and I think that's just because the players want to hear their characters' names spoken. Yeah. Because once that name is spoken, they can begin to pull that thread well, and try for a meeting. And b before you, we get to that point, I just got to say, I love when she's talking to Yusa, and I think Alora was still there at the time. Jester, when they're reacting to the ritual. So I was scratch. Do you know what that is? <laughs> I just love that comment. <laughs> Everybody, like, Liam and Talzin both just look at her like, what? <laughs> I think in some ways that was Jester doing her own thing to make them feel dumb. Or to make her seem I think it was her, her, her trying to seem, you know, oh, I'm badass. I can do this. Do you even know what that is? Because I can do this. You know. Yeah, but I think she was doing it in a mocking way. Mm -hmm. To knock them down a peg. Because they've been all sort of arcane, high, and mighty. Gotcha. This whole time. Um. So I think it's part of that balance that the Traveler uh, has a tenant for. Yeah. Um, but they leave the tower and they say, they remember, hey, we can get tattoos. Because mm -hmm. Orly's here. And part of me... See, this is where I'm a much meaner DM than Matt because I probably would have said uh, the ball eater's not here. Mm. Why? Because Orly said we will work for you. We'll continue working the ship. Right. And where? But they haven't had to coordinate anything with him and they really need to yeah see i would have um i guess i'm in between the two of you because i would have rolled a percentage chance there's a chance they happen to be in in doc okay he kind of just gave it to him you would say no i'd be like oh, i'll give you a chance maybe like a 20 percent, 25 but i'd roll percentile dice and see you know okay yeah it's fair but the the flip side of that is is orly is a uh community created npc the players love interacting with him yeah uh and getting them the these tattoos uh yeah that's the other side of it he did you know yeah there yeah there's a lot of a lot going into it uh, and I'm not saying what he did was wrong. I'm just saying that I'm meaner than Matt. <laughs> yes. Uh, and also to, to to push home on the fact that they have the ball ear to facilitate Traveler Con, and that requires planning. Yes. And while Jester has been thinking about it, worrying about it, and getting to it on time. I think, and maybe Matt will have some other way of of providing this hint, but it's something that we talked about last week about them being political figures. Yeah. Um, and that requires foresight and planning. And thus far, they've been very reactive to a lot of things. Yes. Uh, and this campaign, unlike last campaign, 
Matt has basically given them, here are the players that you're up against. Mm -hmm. uh, he now has identified everything, and it's a matter of, can they stop this inertia? Yes. And he does have rip cords in place. How do you mean? Uh, so, if it seems to be too much for the Mighty Nine, or they don't go for it, to keep Exandria intact, to be able to continue in Campaign 3, Alora knows she can contact yeah. Vox Machina. They can save the world. Sure. So he's, he's got the ripcords in place to not destroy Exandria. Yeah, that's true. Um... But we do get the tattoos. We do. Uh, we have not tries to decide between strength and charisma at Laura's stat shaming. <laughs> stat shaming, egging. Oh, you need to get the charisma. It's only a five, you know. Yeah. Because um, either one of those would have been a modifier boost to it. Yeah. To, to not and. Uh, I, I think I think Sam was torn. I think he wanted to do strength because he liked playing the low charisma. It's still low charisma. You're right. Um, it's just not but, a minus three anymore. I, I, but I think he enjoyed that, you know, doing mm -hmm. that. And he was just like, but, you know, mechanically I should bump that one up. Well, and there's an argument to be made that... She should, because not and Jester do a lot of the talking. Yeah. Like, the two high charisma boys shut up and stay back. Yeah. Um, but then again, next level, she gets reliable talent. That still makes her... Uh, Can you give her persuasion? a persuasion? Eleven on the one persuasion. She's that she's, in. I think she's trained in persuasion. Yeah, and a nine on, you know, um, minimal. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, that's. Yeah, and I'm not saying she did the wrong choice, and especially I, I like the way they described the tattoo. Yeah. You know. The, well, especially the, after the perma makeup slash Mardi Gras mask. Yeah, when he asked, "Wait, what gem is it?" It's like aquamarine, and I was like, and then Sam started describing. It. I was like, "Yep, that fits." Yep. Uh, Jester gets the traveler tattoo. Yeah, I was trying to think what color the diamond would be. White. I think it's going to be prismatic, almost. Because diamond's going to reflect. Yeah, that's fair. So I think there'll be a lot of blues because of her skin. But then when the light hits it, it'll... So, like, so basically she got a glitter tattoo. She got a glitter tattoo of the traveler's hands hugging her. <laughs> nice. Uh, and Bo finally delivered on her promise of getting a tattoo honoring Molly. Yep. Uh, and it came with a wisdom stat bump. So her DC is now exactly what Matt's been rolling. <laughs> That's one way to look at it. Because uh, Matt's been rolling 16s. Yep. Uh, so. He's still going to be saving. Yep. Uh, uh, but Matt almost tries to fast forward. Unless you have anything. Well, yeah, let's... Um, well, one... They all got bad concepts. Oh, yes. They all passed out. Yes. And that... And... I was so, like, is that really what happens? Maybe I just have a high pain tolerance. 
But I've got tattoos on my legs, on my shoulder, all up and down my arms. I've never... Like, I know, I know it's possible for people to pass out from pain. Right. But I, I don't... I've never heard of anyone getting a tattoo pass out from the pain. Um, but maybe it happens. But it, ha it got me thinking how, what might be a better way or a, a narrative way to do that? You know, I probably would have made him do a couple of checks, like depending on how long the tattoo was going to take, maybe once an hour check. Um, fail on the, the first failure gives you the frightened condition. Because you always see people screaming and jerking away from the needle. Okay. Um, you know, and a second failure might be a pass out or, you know, cause yeah, yeah I, I've heard of people fainting. Hmm. Um, not often, but I've heard of it, you know. Um. You know, but it's, I don't know, for me, maybe I just, maybe I'm just trained in concepts. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I had an idea uh, just before we had to set a, get come on the air, where to tell a story of the tattoo and to express exactly how much damage yeah, see, they're taking. I don't know that um, it would actually do damage, though. Like, I could see the frightened effect. The second one, okay, you're, you know, story-wise, your tattoo is messed up because you jerked when the needle was there, and now you've got this bad line, you know. Three, fade. Okay. I, I don't know that I would inflict, and if I did, it would not be more than one or two hit points of damage. Okay, because um, the system that I came up with is basically uh, you choose which stat you're getting the increase to. Okay. And then you roll that stat as a, a check. DC is 13. Okay. I sort of pulled that DC out of my butt, but it's high. It's low enough that it's easily attainable. Mm -hmm. but not so low as they're going to need to roll well, potentially, unless their stats plus three are better. Right. Um, but I was thinking the way to, to do it would be a D4 every test, and a con save would half that. Mm -hmm. But they get uh, a number of tests... Um, they need three plus their modifier in successes. Hmm. And if your stat's less than 10 to reward bumping a, a dump stat, they get advantage on the tech. Hmm. The idea being your body is more accepting of the increase of the magical increase. Okay. Whereas if you're already good, there's more, you know, there's more ego and yeah. energy in that stat. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um. Just, I mean, it's, and it's not, from a play standpoint, it's not going to matter. Right. Except, well, if you're doing, say, hardcore healing, like right. we like to do. Right. You're probably not going to lose a hit die's worth of damage to the to the tattoo, but yeah. it might cost you that hit die to heal that, which is reflective of how sore you are for yeah. a day or two. I, the other option know. is exhaustion. Yeah, and I thought about that too, but I don't think it would be that many levels. I think at most it would be one, one level yeah. of exhaustion. And I can see that being folded into the check system I did. Um, I still think I would do every hour, half hour, not base it on the stat you're trying to increase. 
I do agree that it should be a constant period to just withstand the pain of a tattoo. If I was going to do damage, again, it would at most be once per whatever the check, one per whatever check, okay. and save means no damage. Okay. Uh, and I, I guess it depends on your outlook on tattoos. You know, for me, getting a tattoo relieves stress. It's an enjoyable, it's a pleasurable feeling, yeah. you know. So I would not, like in my brain, I don't think there should be any real, like for me, going, getting tattooed, there's no negative. I'm not taking damage. I'm not getting a level of exhaustion. I'm not, you know, but that's me. And I know there are people who do freak out with when that hits. You are bleeding and you are getting a scar. You are bleeding. You are getting a scar. That is true. And I see that argument. <laughs> but it's like, you know, for me, and, and I don't know. And maybe it's that it, my, my personal experience yeah. with tattoos has tainted that. Yeah. Um, but that's how I would do it. Right. Um, but but real, real quick. What do you think the safe was to not pass out? Nine was the highest roll, highest total received. Was it 10? Was it 15? And I think, you know, and that's only 10. And that's another thing. I think that the, the check of the DC would also be dependent on how long you're being under for. Yeah, well, and see, and that's, Matt didn't have that clearly mapped out either. Right. Because I would um, do that almost like exhaustion, like force march checks. First hour you're getting tattooed, it's a 10. Second hour, it's an 11. Third hour, it's a 12. Okay. Because it does. The longer you have to sit still yeah. in one position while you are being poked and bled and scarred, yeah the harder it is to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Moving on to roll for vinegar. Yeah, well, I guess... The one thing I wanted to talk about is Jester. Okay. And we don't have to spend much time on it, but Jester freaking out when she's like, wait, do I have to get naked in front of Morley? Yeah. Um, You'd be tattooing my chest. And... Yeah. And the selective amnesia of... Uh, we, we've all seen each other naked already. Being a voyeur and being an exhibitionist are two different things. Yeah, well, and Jester's definitely a voyeur. And you can be a voyeur and not an exhibitionist. And you can be comfortable with a select group of people seeing you naked without being comfortable with everybody seeing you naked. It's true. Um, so I don't know that that was really necessarily out of character. Um, I, I, I think at the beginning of the campaign, she would have been upset if Caleb had seen her naked. They were in the bath at the beginning of the campaign. Oh, that's true. It was when they first got to the dash. So that was episode... Seven or eight? Well, day three, had, well, day seven that they've been together? They had also had quite a few fights for their life together at that point. Fair. <laughs> Trauma bonds you. But the, the, what, the thought that, I, that occurred to me is because she is attracted to four, because she wants that kind of thing, now she's more mm. aware. That's where my mind went. That could be. Um, but the meal that almost wasn't, that Matt, again, tried to uh, fast forward over uh, Liam's desires. Uh, but Liam put his foot down and said, yeah. damn it, I want to... Role play fish and chips. Yeah. Uh, and we got arguably the best... RP scene of the episode. Yeah. Um, and, and this scene is a big reason why Liam's my MVP. Yeah, same. Uh, Liam lays it, or Caleb lays it out. 
here's what's before us. Yeah. And what that is the sentence that just came out of my mouth? Yeah. Uh, and also the first time really that Caleb has sought the wisdom of Caduceus. Yeah. Um, Jester has, Ford has a lot. Mm-hmm. Bo has. Yep. Not really hasn't. No, but yeah. she's picked his brain a couple of times when they've taken watches. Yeah, on the, the rare occasion that they are on watch together. Not not really sought wisdom, but just like, what, what do you, you know? Yeah. To see where his mind's at. Yeah. Uh, and it gave Taliesin a moment to shine. Mm-hmm. As he articulated Caduceus's thoughts yep. on destiny. Um, some of which I had a, uh, I had difficulty in not laughing. Uh, not because they're wrong or that they're yeah. particularly amusing. Just that and I don't know why but whenever Taliesin Caduceus is talking about destiny and how, you know, the line especially in this episode that he said was, you know, I never felt it quite as much until I met you. Yeah. And, like, the meta part of my brain was because you didn't exist until they met you. You didn't exist until <laughs> Molly died and <laughs> Talison had to cram for a new character. Yeah. <laughs> and also there's the meta aspect of, yeah, it's a destiny, and it would certainly appear that way, but this is a a prepared story. Yeah. You know? Uh, so it's just, it's it's funny to me uh, on that meta level. Yeah. Um, but Travis's reaction in that scene, well, not just his reaction, because I noticed something on my rewatch. And I want to see if you noticed it. And it was Travis sort of puffing up his chest a little bit and putting his chin forward and his lips. He's doing this. I didn't really notice the facial. I noticed the puffing of the chest. Yeah. And I think I was like... Is that was did he have something in his teeth, or was that him getting into Ford physically? Mm. That he's what he was doing with his mouth is him trying to put his tusks in. Yeah, that could be. Um, and when he was speaking, he's he was doing more more of this. Yeah, slightly. And I think it's because he's trying to make his mouth have tusks when there aren't any tusks there. Right. Um, okay, I can see that. And that's the other reason why I think that that scene was... And the first time it was just it was subconscious. It wasn't all, until my rewatch that I noticed that. Mm-hmm. But it was like all three of them like dialed it up Yeah. for that scene. Um. And I think Matt picked up on that and felt a little bad that he had tried to roll out over that. Yeah. Uh, Because later, when they're all on the boat again, he says, is there anything anyone wants to do before we end the night? Yeah. In in fact, he started to say, you guys take your... Well, before you guys sleep, is there anything... Yeah. You know, he wanted to make sure. Right. Uh, And largely that's because the last four or five episodes, when they've gone into a rest, they've gone into a rest and just wanted to just get the rest over so they could get on to more exploring the halls. Um, But uh, Ford has his great responsibility, great power and great responsibility moment. Yep. His Spider Man Uh, line. (laughs) I mean, it wasn't quite that, but it was basically that. It yeah. was it was the whole idea, the philosophy of you have the power 
knowledge and opportunity to act. Is it not incumbent upon you yeah. to act? Um, and by not acting, you have made a choice equal? Mm -hmm. uh, basically saying, you know, if we do nothing, then we are as responsible for the hell that's coming. Yeah. Um, and also, that line in particular was after Caleb pointed out, this is our death. Yeah. Guys. Uh, so I think, and I don't know if that was always in Ford's makeup or if that is a reflection of the choice to make him a paladin. Basically, that this is what a paladin would do, so now I must do it. I don't think either is true. I don't think it was part of his makeup. I, th I think he was... But I think it's... I think his growth over the campaign is where that came from, and it is why he chose to become Paladin. Okay. More like, more, more like, you know, I, I, I got this power. I don't know what it is. I want to learn. I want more. I want, you know, and then the okay, let's go get Ugatoa out because I want more power. I want this controlled water. You know, I, you know, yeah. It was, a, it was a greed thing at first, and he's like, oh wait, this is bad. Maybe I don't want this. Yeah. And what do I do? See, now I know where this power is coming from. I've got to do the right thing and not let it free. And that, that growth of, I want power, oh, wait, I need to be responsible with this power I've got, is what led him to Paladin. Rather than, oh, I'm going to multi-class into Paladin, now I have to watch, you know. That's fair. Uh, I also wanted to bring up Caleb's vulnerability in that scene. Yeah. And it's something that... Beauregard commented on at one point mm -hmm. uh, that you know you're being very vulnerable. Caleb made a joke out of it. It's not not hard. Uh, but he was the one, and he he said, "Look, I accept that going to the dash is what we need to do." But going and talking to that man is something I cannot do. Yeah. Um, and Caduceus, another great moment, was saying, you know, okay, we'll protect you from that. By the way, you were great in the ball. You put everyone before you. Yeah. Even though you were tempted. Yeah. By these things. But I don't even know if that's necessarily true. It's not. Um, I think they took his, particularly the staring into the waterfall mm -hmm. thing as being tempted to go into the study. And I don't think it was that at all. I think it was he, want, he wanted Frumpkin to come back. Yeah. Um, and was worried that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, we of course the 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 comeuppance for rolling over all the RP is when Orly comes up with breakfast and they are leaving already. Yes. Um, and yeah. also the chance to coordinate travel plans for TravelerCon. Yeah. Because they need to tell Orly, you need to be in Nicodranas on this day mm -hmm. because we need to leave so that we can get to uh, I, was, I almost went directly into the Sylvain Isles, but that's for the Basculus. Uh The island that they need to go to. Yeah. Travel. Um. Yeah, and another thing, before they leave, they do have the the uh, Bowen not talk. Yeah. The shipper talk. 
Yeah, well, and before they leave, uh, there was the gut punch with Not and Jester. Mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, it hurts too much to be here for just a few hours yeah. and then leave again. Yeah. And uh, the, the, don't you want to see your parent? No. Don't you want to see your kid? No. Uh, yeah, I felt that. Yeah. I, I thought you would. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. But yes, the, the shipper conversations. You know, where... And on the way to go to see Ormond. Because mm -hmm. the same, they paired off again in different ways. What do you, you know, what do you think they're. What do you think? Oh, I'll tell you what's going on. She likes him, and I'm pretty sure he likes her. Oh, I'm going to talk to him. It's been a while since I checked in with him. Um, and then they go into the confiding. And not makes the joke about the flask having been empty the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and do you think it was a spontaneous thing on Marisha's part? Or a deliberate thing. Her accidental confiding about her instinct to lie. No, I think that was in the moment. Um, and it was actually kind of really well set up by Sam. Yeah, and, and that's what I thought too, especially... Because when because, she goes, oh shit, am I confiding in you right now? That was a genuine expression on Marisha's face. She's like, oh wait, I just stepped right into this shit, didn't I? Uh, yeah. But it was like, also, not learns Jester's lesson from episode one. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to trade information, make sure you get the information first. Ha 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 ha. Yeah. Uh, Oh, no, that wasn't Jester. That was that was Yasha, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Jester was in on the conversation, but it was Yasha pointing that out. Yeah. Anyway, but yes. Uh, and not begins with a lie. Mm -hmm. Which I think is what prompted that whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Especially because Marisha just got promoted. Like, she had just gotten her... Yeah, it's official awesome. clothes and everything. And here's your room, thousand square feet. That's big. Yeah, and, and and I like the comment. You think she's confiding in him? She confides in everybody. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. If you confide in everybody, is it really confiding though? Yeah. I mean, I guess if you're expecting everybody not to say anything. But if you're putting it out there for everybody, you're putting it out there for everybody. Well, I said, yeah, confide implies confidence. Yes. So secrecy. Oh, fair. Uh, the interesting... I would like to know why Liam chose to ask expositor Lionette for access to the library. Because he could have just either assumed it or just said Bo or Beauregard, because he usually calls her Beauregard. Yes. But why do you think he chose to address her as expositor lionette? That's what I that's in that scene, that's that's the one thing that I, I want to pick apart. I think there was a couple of things. The, I think the big thing, the one thing that I assumed right away was, okay, this is, you know, we're here, we're in this place. I know how rules go in, like, I don't want to say secret societies, but, you know. This is a structure. This, well, there is a structure. power structure. How do let I me, navigate Let me it? be formal here. Okay. I think part of it was Liam... Not so much to Marisha, but hinting that, hey, Table, we barely have any of her backstory here. 
Everyone else is coming to the front, but she's like staying cool on the back burner this whole damn campaign. Yeah. This is about all we've got out of her. Which they are probably going to have to go to her hometown to figure out why Oban was there looking for stuff on the Cato gas. Yep. Uh, so I think she's on borrowed time. Yeah. And I, I think you, I think part of it was Caleb recognizing the formality of the situation and trying to play into that because he knows what that's like. And part of it was Liam trying to say, Hey, backstory check. <laughs> that's fair. What was your take on it? I don't know. I think part of it was the setting, mm -hmm. that they're in a formal setting. She now has power. And I think in yeah. some ways it was Caleb trying to remind her that she has power now. Yeah, I can see that, definitely. Um, um, because yeah. he's asking her for permission. More, more of a, hey, you've made it, you know. Yeah. And he uses her title. So he used her title and asked her for permission. So both things are, you have power here. Yeah. You're not just the peon anymore. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to ask. You now do. Um, which I think was sort of what Dyron yeah. was trying to get across. Yeah. There's going to be more you. But, and... Yeah. And... I think because because of the dynamic that Bo and Dyron have and that Marisha and Matt have, that connection wasn't getting made. Yeah. And so Liam, I think, tried to put a, a bow on it. As it <laughs> <laughs> uh, to to bring it to light. Yeah. Um, and also to give him an out for not going. Yeah. Um, and his research role didn't really bring up anything more, except that uh, well, it brought up the six six location points that are the anchors for the chains. Yeah, well, and and it's also the first mention, concrete mention of Vasselheim. Yeah, this campaign. Um. And that these are copies of texts that are there, mm -hmm. uh, which are just down the road from the Temple to Saren, right? If memory serves, because um, that's where Ion's Temple was. If memory serves, right down the road. Um, but we get to uh, so. Or mid. Well, yeah, okay. And talking about the Rizdun. Yeah. Well, yeah, I figured we'll get to that when we start speculating. Okay. Uh, but they get to Ormid's place. Uh, they wait until they've potentially made an error to bring out the animals. Yeah. Uh, and it was really their trust issues versus Ormit's patients uh, slash Matt's yeah. um, in that scene because it's like look this our mutual ally gave you a letter of recommendation and you came to me on his recommendation of me mm -hmm. either we trust each other or you get the fuck out of my office yeah and if we're going to trust each other, then we have to exchange this information. And oh, how much it hurt Bo to give up the scrap of cloth and the broken device. Yeah. Um, which I would like to get into in a future episode. Like why yeah. she wanted to keep it. Um, like, putting that out there 
is the, the hardest bit of evidence that they can give that look this this bad stuff's happening in Jorahas. It's not them doing it. Yeah. And look, this belongs to a guy here. Well, and yeah. And I loved Ormid's the lackey. Yeah. Um, the thing that stood out to me in the conversation was when they mentioned the beacons. And Ormid jumps on it and starts grilling them almost about it. How do you know yeah. about them? Where did you find Did you find one? Do you, do you know? Yeah. What do you know? How do you know? And then it's finally when they're like, oh, well, the two things may not be. Okay, good. We're on the same page here. Don't look into that. We're dealing with this. Kind of red, ro rose some red flags in my mind. Well, he flat out says that he thinks that what the Empire is doing with them is good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's... I mean, I see where he's coming from, but I think also he's wrong. I think they are connected. Um, well, I, I, I don't think he doesn't think they're connected. I think he doesn't want the Mighty Nine to think they're connected. Uh, because when he said that, my ass is like, insight check him now, please. Oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, real quick. Because we have to get into speculation now before I forget what I'm thinking of. But we have the Pumat soul. They go to the invulnerable vagrant. Yes. After meeting with Orman. Um, and Orman tells Jester not to, to stop feeding Sprinkles candy. Yes. Um, oh, one other thing. Haas seems to have the same problem as Jester. Yes, with, with sending. sending. And, the, and I love the players are like going, hey, wait a minute, how many words is that? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was funny. Uh, so, oh, and she kept not having scrying. Like, what does Jester think she's going to be doing when she's preparing her spells? Not scrying. I, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I I think I think it's less that she didn't think she would be scrying or didn't want to scry as she didn't want to be used just for scrying. No, that's fair. Yeah. I think it was more like... But the last time she didn't have it, she said she had prepared a combat spell specifically. Right. Um, and we don't know what she, but it's gonna, if she prepared a combat spell, it's gonna come in handy, turns out. Yep. Because when they get to the Pumats, there are barren shelves, and I loved the interaction between, it reminded me of that call, I think it's college humor video. It's one of the ones where they do like the real life RPG. Okay. Skip, skip. Or they get the thing, they get the, they throw it away. And it's like, hey, that's an important thing. Dude, it's green. No. <laughs> it's no. like tier all all of Pumat's crap tier one <laughs> uh, gear. Uh, but they also get their first mission from him, the basilisk. Mm -hmm. uh, oil, slime. Um, and then we get why Matt was in such a rush to get them to Nicodronus uh, or to leave Nicodronus. Yeah. To get to Zadash. Zadash, yes. Uh the Catogast attack. Yes. Now, do you think Matt always planned it to happen at the Invulnerable Vagrant? Or do you think he had planned it somewhere else? Or that there was a different trigger for the event to happen in the next scene, wherever that next scene was. I think he wanted it at the Vagrant. 
but if they didn't go there, it would have happened somewhere else. Okay. Um, uh, here's my question. It targeted Caduceus. Uh-huh. Why? Oh, I, I've got my opinion. I want to hear yours. The Laughing Hand has fought the Mighty Nine. Oban has fought the Mighty Nine. They know who the healers are. Okay. Caduceus is a great cleric. He is arguably the most effective healer of the two clerics that they have. Because if they drop to zero, he heals for full. He has Spare the Dying as a bonus action. He's the one that actually heals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, he's the one you kill first. Okay. You kill the healer first, and then you can take the rest of them out at your leisure. So, this you think this thing is tied to Oban? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's definitely the Catogas. Oh, it, okay. I didn't miss that. Did they say that? No. Matt tried to throw them off the scent. But it's definitely the Catogast. Because Marisha's going through her notes about what she's... It, the Catogast is spectral. It is a drow. Okay. I mean... Yeah. It's an assassin. It snuck up on them, did sneak attack damage, uses poison, is spectral, and a drow. I mean, it's yeah. all the boxes. Okay. okay. Well, that blows away my theory then. <laughs> I mean, I, Travis. I thought, might, I thought it might be something Ukatoa sent at them, and it's going after Caduceus because he's the one that basically headhunted his champion. Uh, well, and that might be based on what Travis was joking about at the end, because he, when Matt said red hair, I think he missed. I think he was he was in too much shock from Caduceus. What's your armor class? Yeah. Okay, you take this much damage. I think he was just. It's, it's brain just scrambled, and he didn't hear the first part of the thing. His brain engaged when he said red flowing hair and a specter, and I think he was like this ghost of Avantika. And that's kind of where my brain was. Okay. And so I was like, okay, he's taking out the guy that had hunted his champion. Uh, but no. But it's, still my employees, will you? <laughs> no, it's, it's definitely Caduceus is the, the big healer. Okay. Kill the healer first. I just, yeah. Um, now, interestingly, and I don't know if it was an oversight or not, because the end of the thing, Matt's doing, he's doing this for an effect, not necessarily for combat. Con save against poison, but no half damage on a save, which means it's not a damage poison, it's a control poison. Or it's a weaker poison, like poison spray. Well, no, it's. I think it's drought poison. Okay. Where if you fail to save, you're paralyzed. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the hope. Yeah. Is that Bang, as much of his health as can be taken, is paralyzed, fade, second round, finish him off. Yeah. Was her plan, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think that's still going to be what she does once we roll initiative. Yeah. Matt, again, was very kind in letting Caduceus roll an attack roll. Mm -hmm. Because technically, they have the surprise condition, which means you can take no actions or reactions. Right. So even the attack of opportunity that he let him take, because in theory, that's what it was, Yeah. Uh, should not have gone off. Yeah. But it gave Matt the opportunity to let him roll. What'd you get? 23. She's using her, she uses her reaction to parry. He miss. Yeah. Because Travis shit a brick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what? <laughs> 23 and you miss? <laughs> yeah. I've had some of those moments. And I was trying to think of how how that happened. And the only thing I can think of is the base AC is 19 or 20. And the parry, the proficiency modifier is 4. Mm -hmm. Is 3 or 4. Um, well, it, 
have to be four unless it's higher than 20. Right. 23 meets. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So it'd have to be 20 and four or higher. Yeah. On one of them. Yeah. Uh, unless the proficiency modifier is six, in which case it can be as low as 18. Right. Base. Um, and I was like, how, how does it, how do you get that? And the only thing, like, the only thing I can think of is a double stat AC. Mm -hmm. uh, where she, the Cato guest is using Dex and Charisma, say. Yeah. Which are both stats that Drow get a bonus for. True. Or it, the Cato guest is, has hellish armor. Yeah. Um, that's a high base AC and a plus five Dex. It's so like a 13 base, five Dex, that's 18. And a plus six proficiency bonus on the parry. Mm -hmm. um, but a, rogue encounters are rough if the rogue is solo for the for the game master. Matt has added an element of phasing in and out. Yeah. This, you know, the the Klingon bird of prey stalking the Enterprise sort of a thing. But all that means is first round of combat, everyone readies actions to attack. And then she appears and they all fucking unload on her. Yeah. Basically the way that you kill a, a, a face fighter. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering if Matt has a workaround for that. Um, although maybe not. Maybe he or how long is it going to take the group to figure out? Let's all just ready it. Well, I think they do that immediately. Okay. Caduceus might use his action to heal himself. Jester might use her action to buff people. But everybody else is, I'm readying yeah. an action. Um, what, will, what will keep his monster alive is... She phases in and uses a ranged attack and is nowhere near the melee people. Yeah. Um, and then just phases again. Uh, which is the real danger here because, like, a phase spider has to be on top of you and biting. And a spectral rogue. Draw with a hand crossbow. Yep. And all of it poison. So it's. Patoom, patoom. Oh, you fail, you're paralyzed now. Yep. So you're out of this fight until you save. Oh, everyone's paralyzed? Okay, she comes in, finishes the job. Yep. Uh, um, I think that's her plan, but I don't think they don't know that. Anyway. But I think Matt will get one to three rounds of combat out of this encounter, and the Kato gas flees. Okay. Because I think this is just trying to put the fear of them and to throw them off the scent. Real quick, I want to say a couple things about the Rizdun. Yes. Real and, quick. And the beacons, because okay. there are five beacons and six chain locations. Okay, that, that's one theory I had. Is there is there actually five beacons, or is there a six? six. Yeah. Um, Luxon, the Rizdun, both from before the time of the gods. Both are the things that were floating over Alexandria beforehand. Now, my question, are they opposites? Is the Luxon actually good and the rest an evil? Or is this yet another gray area? Or where, another lie of Thor's doom? Yeah, another lie. Or is this one of the, well, we kind of need to compromise the two. Neither is good in and of itself. One is just order and one is chaos. Yes. It's a lawful evil versus chaotic evil. Well, we haven't seen that the Luxon's evil. I think it's an order and chaos thing between Theros right. Doom and yeah. the Luxon. Okay. Um, if you're going to make that comparison. One thing I want to mention, whether it's a beacon, a chain, both, they're one and the same. Ashgard Garrison. Have you noticed that a lot of stuff happens there? It's almost like the people who are manipulating shit are trying to do some big blood sacrifice through these battles there. Yeah, or that what 
what they need, what the extra planar things need, is there. Yeah. We need to take, no, we need, it, it's like Jerusalem in the Crusades. Yeah. Whichever side has it, the other side's attacking it. Yep. So, um, those were the things I wanted to mention. I would go more into depth on them, but we don't have time. Yep. Perhaps we'll be able to hit it next week. Yep. We'll see you guys next week.